So before starting our panel, let me uh, welcome and thank you for attending this session in this particular day. I hope everyone in the call and their families are safe and healthy during this outbreak, during this extraordinary difficult situation. Today we come together under the umbrella of a common theme, speaking about against torturous activities. Specifically, this day, June 26, is dedicated to call all stakeholders anywhere in the world to unite in support of those who have been tortured and those who are still tortured today. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Burak Haylamas and I will be hosting the panel on behalf of Human Rights Defender Committee of Human Rights Solidarity based in London. What we'll be speaking today. Today, we will discuss the implementation of impunity practice for non-derogable rights and obligations, such as prohibition of torture with a specific eye on Turkey. In that regard, we will be referencing to the report, which I will be providing initial information in a second, and one of our panelists will delve into the findings. And we will be discussing the possible application of international mechanisms, as well as underlying the difficulties therein. A very quick reminder is that today's panel is part of us getting started in Human Rights Law series. We have resources in our website and more happy to provide you more resources if there are things that you're specifically interested and want to explore. The report, Impunity, an Unchanging Rule in Turkey, has been recently published with the involvement of the Italian Federation for Human Rights, Human Rights Defenders, and Arrested Lawyers Initiative. The report underlined that impunity practice cannot be considered as an aberration in Turkey because there has been a consistent pattern throughout the years where public officials have been acquitted for activities that are considered as severe human rights violations in normal times. The pattern indicates that Turkey's impunity policy has three pillars. First, the moral legitimization of the unlawful acts of state officials. Second, the protection provided for perpetrators by administrative and judicial authorities. Third, the legal regulations either constitute obstacle for investigation and prosecution or provide for an explicit impunity for perpetrators. Before starting with the analysis of the detailed findings of this well-prepared report, I would like to provide procedural information about the panel site. First thing first, we are recording the panel and we intend to publish it through social media platforms for our larger audience. Second, we will be having a one Q&A session for all of our panelists at the end of the webinar for approximately 50 minutes. In case there's a question, I would like to invite to use the chat box where our team will go through those questions and we will do our best to answer them. Also in Q&A session, if you can use the raise your hand tools, then we will be able to give you the floor. If you cannot answer all questions, you can always reach out to us and our panelists individually to get your questions answered. Once more, I would like to thank you all for uh, your, for, I would like to thank you all of our attendees allocating time in this Friday afternoon. I hope the session goes well and I hope you find it informational. So I would like to, to invite Mr. Joshkun Yurumas, who is going to be our first speaker and who is qualified lawyer both in Turkey and the UK. Mr. Yormaz will make a presentation about the report's finding that I mentioned above. Mr. Yormaz, stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, but thank you uh, for facilitating this event. Um, thank all the good people at the HRS. And uh, I thank all uh, distinguished fellow speakers for being here this uh, Friday evening. Well, um, the thing, um, Impunity is, um, has always been a problem in Turkey. Impunity offered to state officials for acts they perpetrate, um, illegal acts they perpetrate in the performance of their duties. Um, historically, uh, in the 1980 uh, coup d'etat, the military junta following the coup d'etat uh, with a constitutional amendment um, offered uh, complete impunity uh, to um, to whoever was involved in the in the coup, and uh, unfortunately, um, people responsible of um, hideous acts following the coup d'état uh, in 1980 
they weren't brought uh, into justice until uh, 30 years from, from the coup itself in uh, when uh, the AKP government um, uh, start, uh, proposed a, an amendment to, uh, to the constitutional uh, constitution, but uh, that didn't go ahead because of uh, political turmoil in Turkey and uh, nobody eventually was brought to justice. And um, well, the thing is, after uh, July 15 of 2016, unfortunately, impunity has uh, stopped being an exception in Turkey and uh, has become the norm. Um, as Brock, you briefly suggested, Turkey's impunity policy has three limbs. One of them is the moral legitimization of the unlawful acts of the state officials. And this was done by by Erdogan at the very top and he said even if these uh, people uh, were released sometime our nation uh, was uh, going to uh, punish them wherever they see them on the streets and uh, another uh, a, a minister a cabinet minister said uh, you know they will beg us to kill them and uh, some religious figures very close to the AKP they uh, they thought about in public rallies in support of Erdogan, they, they thought of, uh, of um, uh, the property of uh, the Gulenists being um, a, a bounty uh, for, the, uh, for the nation. And of course, uh, we shouldn't forget the uh, national TV station, TRT, and uh, TRT proudly uh, paraded uh, high rank uh, military personnel in front of TV cameras who were obviously tortured. Um, the, other, the other limb is the actual and practical pro uh, protection provided to the perpetrators. Um, this, is, this is not legal protection. This is by simply ignoring any applications made in, in, in relation to any acts of torture or ill treatment. Um, Perhaps I can quote uh, the uh, UN's uh, special rapporteur on torture. Uh, he said, um, you know, this is what he found in uh, between 1st of January 2016 and the uh, 1st of December 2016, uh, only in Ankara, um, uh, 24 law enf enforcement office, uh, officers were brought to the attention of the public prosecutor and uh, uh, for, for Acts, for alleged acts of uh, torture and ill treatment, and none of them were indicted eventually. Um, I think another another good example is the uh, the late um, uh, teacher who, who's who's very famous now in Turkey is uh, Gökhan Açıkoğlu. Um, uh, despite uh, evidence, all sorts of evidence and witness statements. Um, Three years down the line, uh, the public prosecutor decided not to pursue the case. Um, the, other, the other limb is perhaps the most important is the you know, legal protection offered to the, uh, to the perpetrators. And uh, these were made in the form of two separate um, acts of parliament and three separate uh, executive decrees uh, following the, uh, the, the failed coup. And um, uh, the, uh, the previously, um, uh, the Turkish parliament uh, offered uh, complete protection, impunity to, uh, to the uh, head of the uh, Turkish intelligence service. Uh, and uh, he, could, he, could, he, he's, he still cannot be prosecuted unless Erdogan himself authorizes it. And the, the, the personnel of the uh, Turkish intelligence service, they may not be uh, prosecuted uh, for any acts of uh, any criminal acts uh, without prior consent of, of the head of the national intelligence service. And um, in, in February 2014, um, the top brass uh, were, um, were offered in, uh, impunity uh, by the Turkish government. Uh, so uh, they, uh, the generals at the top of the uh, Navy, um, Air Force and the army in general, they may not be uh, prosecuted uh, without the consent of Erdogan.
and uh, the um, of course the um, uh, this this is um, when I say when I thought talk about the uh, impunity offered to uh, the members of personnel of the uh, National Security Service uh, is um, uh, it, it becomes more significant uh, given the fact that you know uh, credible reports emerged uh, connecting the uh, the MIT. Uh, to uh, enforce disappearances and uh, acts of torture uh, within the within their headquarters in Ankara. Um, well, um, and and uh, bar associations, um, despite uh, very credible reports from from bar associations. Um, well, the other the other um, the other. Uh, uh, the other impunity offered by by by, by an act of parliament was uh, the the, the uh, Turkish government has uh, amended a particular uh, law called the provincial uh, administration law, and uh, so the um, security personnel now cannot be prosecuted without the uh, consent of uh, political um, political figures. Uh, in, in that area, of course, you know the, this this uh, paved way, unfortunately, to the total destruction of uh, a few uh, Turkish cities and towns in the southeast Turkey. Um, the following the uh, following the uh, failed coup in uh, 2016, um, the uh, Turkish government. Uh, they 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 quickly uh, uh, passed three executive uh, decrees, and uh, which offered, unfortunately, and, and the first time in in the Turkish history, not only to the uh, uh, public officials but to the uh, general public as well. And uh, what what followed was um, the. The, uh, the cadets and uh, low-ranking soldiers who were sent to the uh, famous bridge in Istanbul on the night of the coup, uh, some of them were beaten and stabbed to death. And um, when their families pursued the matter and uh, brought the, uh, filed the suit against, uh, against the perpetrators, um, the uh, public prosecutor's office dismissed uh, all these files uh, with making specific references to these piece of legislation, to these, uh, what we call them KHK, uh, executive degrees, emergency law degrees. Um, and uh, likewise, in a, in a northern city, another public prosecutor dismissed another case uh, just because of, uh, because of the protection that these uh, emergency law decrees offered to the perpetrators. Um, but what is worrying is now these emergency decrees they're not they're not emergency degrees anymore they're incorporated into the, into the law and uh, so that now they are still in place and uh, you know and more soundly so um, for one reason or another um, the um, According to the Turkish Ministry of Justice's reports, between years 2013 and 18, um, some 5,300 people have been investigated for uh, for acts of torture, and uh, only 1,000 of them were ever indict indicted, and only a mere fraction of them, 70 people, were actually convicted of. Uh, torture and ill treatment, which made the UN rapporteur on uh, on torture conclude. I will quote, if you if you don't mind, the low number of investigations and prosecutions prosecutions initiated in response to allegations of torture and ill treatment seemed grossly disproportionate to the alleged frequency of such violations. So, we find it very very disproportionate. Um, well, since, since um, 2016, uh, numerous credible reports have been published which established the practice 
of impunity in Turkey. Uh, I, I would like to name a few without taking too much of your time. Um, uh, reports by the UN, the Council of Europe, um, uh, European Commission, CPT, even United States uh, uh, State Department and Human Rights Watch. Um, well, perhaps I can conclude by um, just saying what needs to be done. I think uh, responsible institutions should, uh, uh, should conduct more frequent visits to Turkey and uh, perhaps the um, uh, international community could be more pressing in, in, uh, in, in you know, encouraging them to do so. As things stand, you know, uh, the Turkish people have been, you know, let down by the uh, European Court of Human Rights and uh, there are quite a few places they can turn to and unless and until we, uh, the world has a unified and consorted uh, stand uh, against torture and mistreatment and uh, show that these people, the perpetrators, have nowhere to go and nowhere to hide, this will still be, uh, unfortunately, a problem in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Yorimaz. Thank you for sharing this empirical report and also thank you for your notable remark on the imprinted practice in Turkey. So moving forward, uh, I would like to introduce our second panelist, Professor Antonio Stango. Professor Stango is an international human rights expert who has been working in the field from 80s onward. He is the co-founder of the Italian Helsinki Committee and has been leading several NGOs as well as international projects monitoring conflict and crisis areas. He is recently the president of the Italian Federation for Human Rights and professor of human rights and international humanitarian law at Romblin Campus University. Professor Stangl will be speaking on the general international mechanisms for the protection of human rights and the global magnitude legislation as a tool against impunity. Professor Stangl, stage is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, well, as uh, we all know, the international mechanisms of protection of human rights uh, are uh, quite uh, established uh, in a number of uh, conventions uh, and uh, institutions. Unfortunately, they are usually ineffective. And so one of the main issues that we, as uh, not only academics, but especially as a non-governmental organization that work uh, for the defense of human rights, uh, is to try and uh, match the gap between uh, the great uh, um, international uh, standards that are in theory and uh, the practice. As our colleague said before, the case of Turkey is exactly one uh, of the most worrying cases of a, a state that theoretically should be binded by a number of international uh, conventions, including uh, in this case uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, but uh, does uh, not implement uh, all this. Uh, well, speaking about the general mechanism of protection, uh, I mentioned uh, the European Convention. So the European Convention, as we all know, uh, is uh, uh, an instrument that uh, was established by the Council of Europe, exactly in, uh, in Rome uh, in 1950. And it is the only regional organization in the world that has a court, a real court of uh, human rights, that can uh, sentence, can issue sentences uh, against uh, any member state or state party of the convention for specific violations of articles of the European Convention. Uh, so mm, theoretically, uh, we in Europe and Turkey is one of the countries uh, of the European, uh, uh, of the Council of Europe, we should be particularly um, safeguarded by this mechanism. But it is very difficult to arrive uh, to a sentence in favor of uh, the person that claims that his or her human rights have been violated. First of all, uh, all uh, the national remedies uh, should have been uh, already uh, concluded. So the, the trial and the appeal trial, eventually a cassation uh, decision uh, should be 
uh, arrived to the end in the in the country then the person uh, is entitled to uh, present an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court will decide whether um, the appeal is uh, admittable or not, and then comes the rest. Uh, this story can take uh, many years. And uh, uh, when uh, finally the court, that is anyway a very important uh, uh, mechanism, finally the court decides uh, that uh, the rights of this applicant have been violated, the court can issue a sentence obliging that state to, uh, to do something, uh, to restore where it is possible the rights of the person uh, to give uh, eventually compensation and so on. But uh, before arriving to this, uh, a state, especially a state with an authoritarian regime, will do all that is possible uh, not uh, uh, to arrive to that point. Uh, for instance, torture. The case of torture uh, is uh, one of uh, the uh, crimes that is more difficult to demonstrate. Even if a state has um, ratified the optional protocol to the International Convention of, uh, on Torture, uh, that includes the creation of a national uh, preventive mechanism, uh, there are many ways how a state cannot really enforce uh, this. So the, the person that has been tortured, in, uh, usually in a prison, or in custody at the police, uh, will find it very difficult to prove this torture, especially if there is uh, uh, no uh, help from the relevant authorities, especially if the judiciary is not really completely independent. I saw this also in other countries. I visited several times Kazakhstan, for instance, and uh, in that country I had the opportunity to speak with a number of high level officials up to the, the general uh, uh, prosecutor and uh, so on. And uh, all they were uh, explaining, well, we have the national preventive mechanism, but uh, to have it in the legislation and to implement uh, is uh, something uh, different. Then there is the principle of uh, uh, universal jurisdiction. Uh, you know, in some, uh, in some cases, when it comes uh, to uh, serious uh, uh, violations of human rights uh, amounting to crimes against humanity, uh, for instance, uh, every state can uh, decide to do a trial against uh, some person, even if this person is not a citizen of the state and if the fact uh, have not taken place in the Count. Uh, so this is the, basically the principle of universal jurisdiction, but uh, applies only in, uh, in very uh, serious crimes with an international um, relevance. Uh, I mentioned the uh, crimes against humanity can be genocide uh, and so on. And so it's difficult to, to prove uh, that uh, a particular crime amounts to this uh, level. Very often, uh, torture, for instance, is committed uh, in the in the close, uh, in the darkness, in uh, in places where, as I mentioned, it is very difficult to get uh, the proofs for uh, the the person who was a victim of uh, such uh, abuse. So the principle of universal jurisdiction is uh, uh, difficult to apply, especially in this specific case. Another mechanism is uh, the uh, Committee uh, of uh, Human Rights, the Human Rights Committee uh, of the United Nations that was established by the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which entered into force uh, back in 1976. So this committee is uh, um, composed by 18 uh, experts, and these experts may receive uh, complaints also from uh, individuals. And this committee uh, has the, the capacity to address the complaints. How they address the complaints? When they receive a sufficient 
um, evidences that uh, a serious abuse has been uh, done, they can write to the authorities of a certain state, they can ask for more information, they can suggest remedies, they can publish reports. So it is a sort of quasi-judiciary system, but again, being a quasi-judiciary, they are not entitled to issue sentences. So they can anyway uh, issue consideration. So what the UN Committee of Human Rights can do is to issue considerations. The importance of these considerations is uh, the fact that they can point out politically, let's say, more than juridically, the abuses committed by some state. Uh, it is a long process and there are few cases where, when this arise to, to the end. Similar uh, mechanisms uh, uh, are for the group, the working group of the United Nations on arbitrary detention. Um, I have been uh, also uh, using uh, these kind uh, of statements, considerations by the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention that uh, in a way similar to that uh, of the UN Committee of uh, Human Rights uh, may address uh, a case by writing to a state and asking those uh, authorities to, um, for instance, to free a person uh, that is uh, unjustly detained and uh, to do uh, remedies. Well, all these uh, are, uh, I think, the most uh, important, the most relevant international mechanisms for the protection of uh, human rights. Then there, are the, there is the Council, the UN Human Rights Council, uh, with its, uh, its uh, universal periodic review, the UPR. It means that more or less every five years, each of the 193 member states of the United Nations will be uh, examined in its uh, human rights records by all the other states. So um, even uh, uh, non-governmental organization uh, and other can send uh, reports uh, to all the state of the United Nations when it comes to the UPR of some particular state and uh, uh, indicate uh, some uh, violation of human rights that is uh, of particular concern. Then uh, the UN Human Rights Council will uh, with some procedure, with some procedure that takes more than one year, ask the member state to explain that situation and the member state will answer, usually in a written form. But of course, a democratic state with um, independent judiciary, with free media, freedom of association, uh, free lawyers, will have no difficulty to answer in a, in a clear and serious, sincere way to the questions. While um, a state under UPR with an authoritarian regime, without freedom of the media, without freedom of the lawyers, and without the independence of the judges, will find every possible pretext to answer in a um, not acceptable way. Finally, uh, there is a, a, a system uh, that uh, I have to mention and to which we at the Italian Federation for Human Rights, together with other partners internationally, are devoting a, a campaign uh, that is a, a, a non-judiciary uh, method. It is a non-judiciary tool, but uh, I think that it is quite important. It is the so-called Magnitsky legislation. So it comes from the case of a lawyer uh, who uh, discovered some uh, fraud uh, committed by high level uh, officials in the Russian Federation uh, about 10 years ago. He was imprisoned with the uh, accusation of uh, labeling, uh, of defamation, etc. tortured in prison. He died in prison. And uh, after this uh, um, 
in the, the United States uh, uh, because he was defending uh, the business uh, of some uh, Anglo-American uh, businessman, uh, Bill Browder, in the United States was approved the first Magnitsky Act that after a few years became a global Magnitsky Act. So in the name of that uh, Russian lawyer who died in prison, um, the United States first and then other states that uh, have a similar legislation decided to sanction not a state but uh, those uh, individuals, usually high level uh, officials, uh, who committed uh, um, presumably but uh, with uh, quite strong evidence uh, abuses, uh, serious abuses of human rights uh, or uh, uh, acts of uh, grand uh, corruption and uh, who were unpunished uh, in their country. Uh, so how they are sanctioned? They are sanctioned in an administrative way. They will not uh, get the visa for the United States or for the other states that have a similar legislation. Their assets will be frozen. They will not uh, be able to conduct a number of uh, um, uh, international economic activity. This is quite uh, serious because some of these persons uh, uh, not only committed uh, human rights abuses, but uh, at uh, um, a level of corruption uh, very high, they uh, entered in possession of a huge amount of money that should belong to the citizens of their country or to some private uh, business. And so freezing their assets uh, is uh, quite serious for them. This may apply also to high level personalities of government. It is the case uh, not only in the Russian Federation, but also in, in several uh, other states. I remember now Sudan, for instance, uh, but uh, in um, in many states, this uh, this can happen. So it is a, a tool that may be effective, not only by punishing people that uh, otherwise uh, will not uh, be uh, trialed in their country, um, but uh, also by encouraging the states to act against grand corruption and serious violation of human. So the states, and I'm going to conclude my, uh, my speech, states that have a magnificent legislation currently beyond the United States are Canada, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the United Kingdom, uh, Kosovo, that uh, is not recognized by all the international community, and uh, the, um, Australia is going probably to have a magnificent legislation uh, soon. At the European level, we had in the last few years uh, statements uh, by both uh, the uh, Council of Europe and the different institutions of uh, the European Union that would um, uh, favor the uh, creation of a common European Magnitsky legislation. So uh, I am available for uh, any question or further information and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Sango. We will be having the uh, questions at the end of the session, if it works here. Uh, and thank you for your like valuable contributions so far in the field of human rights, uh, and uh, also like well prepared uh, presentation about international mechanisms. Thank you. So after having a general view on uh, international mechanism, our third panelist, Natasha Burak, will be speaking on main judicial and non-judicial avenues available to the victims of the crimes also addressed in the report that Mr. Yor must mention previously. And Natasha Bright is a qualified lawyer associated with the Paris Bar. Her expertise includes international human rights, humanitarian and criminal law, and business and human rights. From academic research to legislation compliance with human rights, Bright plays an important role in her expertise area. She also previously worked various international tribunals including the International Courts of Justice and International Criminal Tribunal. Ms. Natasha Barak, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Barak. Good, good evening, uh, everyone. 
I would like to just mention something it says on the program that I, I, I have, I'm, a, I'm a senior officer so with the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. Just for clarity, I'm here in my personal capacity and uh, my, the view I will present today are my own, not my, my, my organization. I, I wanted to, uh, to add this. So uh, we have heard up, uh, up at a now that, uh, and uh, Choshkun has explained it very clearly, that impunity in Turkey is not only an endemic problem, it has uh, crystallized into legislation, into law. Impunity is now part of the legal and judicial system in, in Turkey. And so the absence of accountability, independent accountability mechanisms in the country has strongly uh, impaired the capacity for victims to seek uh, justice. And uh, Turkey has undertaken several, uh, several reforms and uh, Choshkun has mentioned them. And the question is now, as we are uh, today uh, in Turkey, as victims in Turkey, what are the other avenues? And Mr. Stango has covered a lot of the points I wanted to cover, so I will try to take a, a different approach uh, uh, than, than, uh, than his, and he's made a great presentation of the various mechanisms. So what I will do is, I will try maybe to take a, a, a victim-centered approach, like as a civil society organization representing victims or our victims uh, themselves, what are the avenues, judicial and non-judicial, open today among those uh, presented by Mr. Uh, Stango, and more particularly, how to interact with those mechanisms and what to expect from them? And I think uh, we've already gotten part of the answer uh, about managing expectations and uh, the limitations of those mechanisms, domestic remedies being the, uh, the main uh, and the, the most effective uh, way of uh, seeking justice for victims. But in the absence of domestic remedies, what can, can we do? And so uh, I, I will go through first the CHR. I will go back, I think, to one or two points uh, that I would like to add uh, to build on uh, uh, Mr. Stangl's uh, position. And then I will move to the UN human rights uh, mechanisms and then uh, discuss very briefly uh, universal jurisdiction because uh, if I have time, uh, uh, Mr. Boyer is going to uh, discuss it in more, more length. So regarding the ECHR, so we, 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 uh, we've heard, so the ECHR is one of the remedy open for, for victims and Turkish victims and lawyers in Turkey have throughout the years used the ECHR as a platform for, uh, as an extra step in the judicial process to seek uh, uh, justice for, for victims. And I think that around 40% of the decisions uh, uh, con uh, at the uh, ECHR concern three member states. Turkey being the first one with 16% of the decision at the ECHR, then Russia and Italy. So you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Turkish victims lawyers have widely used uh, the ECHR European mechanisms to, uh, to seek justice. After 2016, uh, there was a lot, due to, after the attempted coup, there is a high, uh, extreme inc increase in the number of cases reaching the ECHR, the court. This is reflecting on the fact that the number of violations on the ground also increased significantly. And so the ECHR received thousands of applications from uh, uh, Turkish victims from varying quality. And this played a very big role in, in, also into the ECHR's response. So at the beginning, the ECHR got a bit scared, took a very timid approach and uh, rejected at the beginning um, uh, some, uh, a lot of decision on the basis that uh, the victim had not, the claimant had not exhausted domestic remedies. Um, quoting, for example, that the constitutional, they haven't uh, raised, uh, brought the court, the case, sorry, before the constitutional court or before this ad hoc commission, I won't, I won't go into detail, created by the government uh, in Turkey. And so, uh, for, for a Turkish citizen, of course, they knew that those mechanisms were not effective, impartial, and independent. The courts refused at the beginning to make, make any position and uh, rejecting the cases. The position has changed due to uh, uh, increased awareness, due to uh, the number of reports and uh, 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 information regarding the uh, effectiveness of domestic communities in, in, in Turkey. And uh, I wanted to, to mention uh, one other point, I think, so I, want, so I see that um, in terms of strategy, so that victims can bring a case at the ECHR, cases rarely reach, reach the uh, stage of admissibility, but if they do, then there is a chance for uh, 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 having violations being uh, found by the ECHR. 
And the question raised, uh, and the point raised by Mr. Sango is the execution of this decision. Even if a big team manages to have the ACHR find a violation, what happened next? Is there actually an effective remedy and implementation execution at the domestic level? And the answer, and I went on the website of the committee of, uh, of the ministers of the Council of Europe to see the uh, latest figures. And so the latest figures uh, date, I think it's March 2020. And around 900 cases are still pending execution in, 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 uh, in Turkey. So you see it's, it's still a lot of cases still pending execution, execution at the domestic level. They are under scrutiny by the committee uh, of uh, ministers, but they haven't been implemented. And um, several cases uh, uh, that I can quote, I think the, the most famous cases are the Altan, the Miltas and Kavala cases uh, at the ECHR. Uh, those uh, uh, three individuals are still in detention despite ECHR uh, uh, decisions to, um, uh, to uh, uh, that, uh, stating that the detention was uh, unlawful. Um, so in terms of ECHR, as, uh, uh, to take maybe the, 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 the side of the civil society and, 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 and victim, I think I would say that the ECHR, it's important to manage expectation with regard to the ECHR. It's an important step and an important mechanism to use, as Mr. Stango has explained, but it's also one with a lot of limitations. The ECHR doesn't have power to uh, force Turkey to um, implement, execute the decision. And this is why uh, Turkey has been ignoring a lot of their, the decision rendered by the ECHR. So this is one of these limitations, but it's an important one. The other one I would like to, uh, to mention uh, are the UN human rights mechanisms. And maybe because you, you've already done a great presentation of the, of the mechanisms, I will see how, and this is something I, I have done um, last year when I used to work with the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute with the Arrested Lawyers Initiative. It's advocacy at the, uh, at the Human Rights Council at the UN level. And there is a lot that can be done and that could be done uh, uh, at this level. It's a system which is an alternative to the lack of domestic remedy, but it's an imperfect system as, uh, as, uh, as you explained, decisions are non-binding. It's, it's for some of the mechanisms, a political process like the Human Rights Council sessions, like the U uh, Universal Periodic Review. Those are a political process. There is no real implementation, uh, no, no, there is no obligation for states to uh, implement the recommendation made during the Universal Periodic uh, Review or for a, a state to uh, implement decision by a committee such as the Committee Against Torture. But despite this lack of uh, uh, um, this risk of this lack of implementation, this doesn't reduce the importance of reporting cases and informa sending information to UN human rights mechanisms. And the reason is that the fight against impunity takes time. It takes years and years and years and years before uh, a case, a prose prosecution investigation can be opened. It could be 10 years, 20 years, it could be tomorrow. But in the meantime, it is essential that violations committed are uh, referenced, are collected, are archived. And one of the best ways to do it is by sending information to those UN human rights mechanisms in the form of uh, reports, submission to special procedures committees, and of course, those people have to follow a certain methodology. And this is what the RSC Lawyers Initiative has been working on. They have provided uh, uh, well-researched um, information, credible information to UN human rights mechanisms, which have in turn referred to their reports and information in their own reports. And uh, uh, you have a lot of them referenced on their, on their website. Another way is uh, individual complaints. Some treaty bodies, such as the Committee Against Torture, can also receive individual complaints uh, 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 from, from individuals and Turkey has accepted uh, this possibility. And it is important for victims also to uh, seize those, uh, those, to use those individual complaints. When we went to Geneva, it was a year ago, uh, we met with the, um, you, the working groups on arbitrary detention. And uh, we were very surprised when they told us that they barely received any applications for, from uh, uh, Turkish victims. Same for the working groups on enforced disappearance. And I think it's really important that uh, work is being done and it's not easy to send applications. So this is why it's the role of civil society organization, international organization to assist local organization and local victims to uh, seize those, uh, those, uh, those mechanisms. But there is a lot that can be do, it can still uh, be done. 
And I really encourage everyone, and I know the RST Lawyers Initiative has been doing tremendous work in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, sense. Uh, I will finish with uh, maybe universal jurisdiction. I will leave it uh, on, uh, on the side. Uh, as Mr. Sango mentioned, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important mechanism. It's a new one, which is uh, developing uh, uh, strongly, in the, which has been developing strongly in the recent years. It is ultimately one of the best alternative, but it's one of the most difficult one to use uh, uh, also. And I, I'm sure uh, Mr. Bowie will, um, will discuss this. So um, there's one other point I wanted to mention was the International Criminal Court, uh, which is on the side because uh, Turkey has not ratified the Rome Statute. So bringing uh, um, the, the, the International Criminal Court is very unlikely to, uh, to be investigating or prosecuting uh, Turkish citizens or uh, crimes committed in Turkey uh, in, the, in, the, in the near, uh, near future. One of the options that could be open is a referral by the Security Council, which has the power to refer a situation of a non-state party. But as you, you know, in, uh, in light of the current political situation, it is very unlikely that uh, the Security Council would refer um, uh, situation to the to the ICC, especially with this two consecutive uh, vetoes by China and Russia in the situation of, of Syria. So I think I will conclude con conclude by uh, just highlighting the importance of civil society and victim to continue their work, and despite the frustration and the lack of immediate resu results for victims, to uh, continue this work of advocacy and recording violations. And this also goes with sending information to public organization, but also in the way you collect the uh, information in your own databases. It is important that you collect information based on international standards. You have several manuals that are available, and this is, I think, uh, a, good, uh, uh, a good exercise. And uh, referring to organizations working on this, I, I wanted to mention three organizations that, uh, uh, in addition to uh, the RST Lawyers Initiative, in Turkey, there are a lot of human rights organizations doing great work. Uh, one of them uh, uh, being the Truth Justice Memory Center, which works on uncovering gross human rights violations, and they have been working on enforced disappearance. And they worked in close collaboration with, us, with UN human rights uh, bodies and other organizations, and they have been collecting and gathering information on the various uh, uh, enforced disappearance that happen in South and Southeastern Turkey. So uh, it's, it's an organization which is worth looking at. And the other one is the Human Rights Association and the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey that works on torture. And if you want more information on those in organization, I'm more than happy to uh, share their uh, website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Barak. Thank you for illustrating alternative ways for those who are suffering from the violations. And it is our best wish that these ways are used immediately by them and which enables victims to find the justice they have been seeking for several years. Moving forward, I would like to introduce our last speaker tonight, Mr. Gonzalo Boye, who is a human rights lawyer based in Spain and notable for his work on universal jurisdiction. Really uniquely today, Mr. Boye himself has been a victim of police torture in the now infamous case of the political kidnapping of Emiliano Revilla. Most recently, Mr. Boy became the target of Spanish police harassment because of representing his client, former Catalan president, Carles Puigdemont. Ms. Boy is, speaking, uh, is going to speak about the lack of effective investigation in relation to torture with examples from Spain. Mr. Boy, the is yours. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I wanted to speak really uh, uh, about the lack of, investi of effective investigation as, as a way to generate more torture and more cases of torture, but also in combination with what uh, my colleagues have been explaining before. And uh, in, in the, the last available data in Spain is from 2017 about uh, torture. And it's amazing because after nearly three years, we don't have available data, official available data of torture case, reported cases in Spain um, since that. In, in 2017, there was reported 1,014 cases of alleged torture uh, <clears throat> committed in Spain by uh, uh, police officers. Uh, 
and no conviction has been achieved uh, since then. As a matter of fact, the last com proper conviction in Spain for torture was uh, in year 2005, uh, which shows a, a total lack of effective investigation and which uh, is not generating a deterrence for these cases to continue to happen. Uh, one of the cases that, that is interesting to show the, the situation in Spain is that uh, only one judge in Spain has been uh, uh, accused or the European Court of Human Rights has resolved in different cases that that judge didn't do a proper and an effective investigation on cases of torture for people that were presented in front of him. This is Judge Grande Marlaska, who uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, made its statement in 2014 for one case, in 2014 for another case, in 2015 for another case, in 2016 for another case, and in 2018 for two other cases. All these people that were tortured, and it's proven that they were tortured, uh, uh, were presented to the, this judge and he refused to investigate that. Well, that judge is today uh, the Home Secretary of the Spanish government. So the expectation that we may have on effective investigation from the Spanish authorities is very poor or very small. But on top of that, I, I'm much more uh, concerned about something different, which is that evidences obtained in Turkey with no guarantees and most probably in, under torture has been used in the Spanish courts as proper evidence and has been accepted as proper evidence by uh, the Spanish judges. Well, this is, uh, this is the other way of the, the other side of the coin of universal jurisdiction, which is the universal use of evidence obtained under torture. Uh, we have tried in those trials to challenge those evidence and the uh, answer from the court uh, was astonished. They said that uh, we cannot challenge uh, those evidence in Spain because those evidence were introduced in the process uh, through legal means of cooper international cooperation among countries and countries that uh, keep diplomatic relations. So the only control that these judges were expecting to do to evidence obtained in Turkey, most probably under torture, is that they came through a diplomatic channel. Well, this is a real risk of spreading the effects of torture, not only to the people who suffered that, but to those people that are convicted at a later stage, even in other countries, based on evidence obtained through torture. And in, and, and in this sense, the cooperation between the, the different uh, uh, security forces within Europe, and especially with, uh, in the European countries with the uh, Turkish police, is something that we really have to look into that because they are taking evidence in Turkey, most probably under torture, they are converting that evidence into intelligence report, and those intelligence report has been used in different places such as Germany, Holland, France, and Spain as proper evidence. Well, it is very difficult to combat those evidence when they are introduced in this way. And I think we should, uh, if we really want to, to to generate a space of deterrence uh, against torture, we really need to focus on what is the use that they made of those evidence that are obtained uh, with torture and how the European countries are collaborating in a misuse of that evidence, which is another form of participation in the torture process, because the, the torture is not, is not committed just to generate suffering in the person, but to obtain something and that the result that they obtain is been internationalized through cooperations among the, uh, the security forces. And that's something very, very, very dangerous 
and uh, and as a matter of fact, we have uh, um, uh, now different different convictions here in Spain, and we have challenged that at the uh, level of the Spanish Supreme Court, and our expectations are really low in terms of the resolution that the Spanish Supreme Court uh, will issue in this uh, at least three cases that we we have been involved directly as lawyers. Um, and this is really something that we may take as a priority because you know that a lot of people from Turkey has emigrated abroad or run into exile through the situation in Turkey. But uh, what is the problem is at, at the end, they are not catched by the Turkish police, but they're catched by the Spanish police or the German police or the French police, and they use the evidence obtained in Turkey. Uh, Natasha was talking before about, about universal jurisdiction, and I think we should all focus and look the case that is ongoing nowadays in Germany against uh, uh, Syria for torturing people. This is a, an excellent example of the use of universal jurisdiction as a way to obtain justice, reparation, and also in a way to create a certain leverage of deterrence against torture. Uh, the European Center of uh, Human and Constitutional Rights from Berlin is leading the, the, the legal team that is handling that case. And for the first time in many, many years, the uh, German prosecutor office has agreed to present charges to a foreign officer for tortures committed in a foreign country against a foreigner. Uh, the, this is the, the full principle of universal jurisdiction, put it all together in one courtroom. Uh, and, and I think we all should uh, learn about that process in the web of the European Center of, uh, for Human and Constitutional Rights. There is a lot of details in different language about, about that case. And, uh, and I think we, we should really, I invite everybody to look the, the tremendous work that has been done by our colleagues from Berlin, because uh, that's maybe one of the way to do it. And of course, Syria got not the same uh, diplomatic and political relations with the European countries as Turkey. But at the end of the day, if we work in a proper way and, and if we follow certain patterns that, that the European Center uh, from Berlin has presented to, to the public, uh, we may succeed in different countries to use that tool of universal jurisdiction. As a matter of fact, we, we have done it in Spain on several occasions. And in 2009, the, the Spanish parliament decided to restrict the, 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 the extension of the Spanish universal jurisdiction, which, which was very open and very suitable for, for this sort of cases. When we found out the way on this side to that restriction of the universal jurisdiction, they changed the law again to make it more restrictive. Uh, finally, in, in, in 2014, we found another way to go in, into, into such process. And at the end, they were so angry that instead of changing for the fourth time the law, they decided to change the jurisprudence, which make it even more difficult or nearly impossible to, to use universal jurisdiction for these cases because the requirements are too big. So Spain moved from the Pinochet case, a very open way to, to exercise universal jurisdiction in cases of torture, to a very restrictive way, which also is a representation of what's the Spanish reality. And in the Spanish reality is that it is extremely difficult to present a case and to obtain a court resolution to open a proper investigation in cases of torture. The last case that I, I would like to mention just to, to finish uh, in order to, to demonstrate how, it, how there is a, a total lack of proper investigation in Spain is a case of a young man that was arrested uh, uh, last year uh, in Almeria and uh, in the same way that it, it happened in the US he he was suffocated and he died in uh, inside the police station 
the police said that he was uh, that, that that was an accident that nothing wrong was done no court wanted to investigate it and on top of that most medias were spreading diversion from the police in order to create the image that uh, this young man uh, died as an as a matter of an accident and also because he got a previous illness well two weeks ago finally appears a video of what had happened at that police station and it was clearly a blood cold murder in a police station with interrogation methods that are, are not allowed in these two weeks no judge has opened a proper investigation of something that we have all seen in a video it is all over and even the the medias that were denying that this has happened at the end they accept uh, they are accepting that this happened but the the major problem is that the judges are not accepting that so uh if as a friend of mine used to say to me it's not not enough to be right it is not enough to be able to express it in a proper way what we at the end need is somebody to accept that this is torture, this is a criminal offense, and this needs a proper investigation. The problems that, that there are uh, at the present time in Turkey and that we have all been reading are more common in other countries than what we want to accept. But uh, I, I propose that we not only concentrate in, in the ways to exercise responsibility towards the direct the people who direct practice torture, but also the people who make a profit out of tortures that are not commit, even committed in their country. It is unacceptable to use evidence obtained under torture in Turkey in any other jurisdiction. And the Spanish police, the French police, the German police, or whoever cannot use that evidence. Prosecutors should not use that evidence. And above all, courts should not accept and validate those evidence because those evidence are illegally obtained. And I, I think we, we, we should coordinate more in, in these efforts and, uh, and try to change, uh, interchange and communicate more the cases everywhere to have a more general view so we can all uh, share experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldboy, uh, for your notable remarks on deterrence mechanism against torture practice and also recent challenge that these alternatives that uh, race confront. Uh, since we have completed our um, panelists' uh, speech, I would like to invite all participants to ask their questions. We will be having around 10 minutes uh, Q&A session right now. Uh, and if you can use the chat box or if you can raise your hand tools, uh, then our technical team will unmute your device. So you can have a chance to ask your question to our panelists. And of course, like, if our panelists wants to ask a question to other panelists, they're very welcome. So I will be looking at. Uh, so we have a question to Professor Stango from San Yilmaz. Uh, he mentioned that we know that states have certain obligations after a violation has occurred under international human rights law and victims should have effective remedy. Given this, is there a state's duty to prosecute and punish the perpetrators of serious human rights violation? If they accept such a duty, does it provide for an individual right for the victim to see offenders prosecuted and punished under international human rights law? In other words, can victims of serious human rights violation in Turkey and anywhere in the world bring their case before ECHR or Human Rights Committee and ask for the perpetrators of this violation to be prosecuted and punished? So thank you for the question. Uh, actually, as I mentioned, it is very difficult to oblige a state uh, to punish uh, the person who is uh, allegedly responsible of this uh, serious violation of human rights, including even torture. So either the state itself uh, wants to uh, punish the responsible or international is quite difficult. There is uh, the European uh, Court of Human Rights but uh, as I said uh, in my intervention before, the European Court can uh, take uh, into consideration uh, an uh, appeal 
um, by a citizen or a person that uh, um, uh, alleges to have been um, violated, abused in his or her human rights only after that uh, all uh, the um, judiciary, uh, the judiciary system in his own country have, uh, has arrived to the end. So I mean, after the trial, the appeal trial, uh, and uh, eventually the cassation trial in his country, a person can uh, apply to the European Court of Human Rights. Then uh, again, uh, as uh, our colleague Natasha said before, uh, the European Court, uh, eventually, if arrives to a sentence against the state, can ask the state to, uh, for instance, compensate uh, a person uh, whose uh, uh, human rights have been uh, violated, but uh, uh, it's very difficult that the European Court will force a state also to punish the persons that are concretely responsible of this uh, violation. That's why uh, we are thinking about uh, non-judiciary uh, systems to have people accountable and to fight against the impunity uh, in an administrative way. This will depend uh, on the legislation of uh, every uh, single state. Possibly we will find uh, some common European mechanism as well, and uh, it will just sanction a person that is uh, uh, presumably responsible of uh, serious human rights violation of grand corruption in, uh, in a way such as uh, freezing the um, assets and so on, as I mentioned before. Yeah, thank you, Professor Stango. And following up questions, there are also lots of questions coming to our chat box. So one question is to our uh, panelist, Ms. Brock, um, asking international accountability mechanism with regard to torture is very few uh, tools which deter perpetrators of human rights violation. However, it's not easy to use this tool. It involves difficulties because of the political and judicial sphere. How can NGOs like human rights solidarity or arrested uh, lawyers um, Build the capacity, knowledge, and financial means to use universal jurisdiction successfully and effectively. It is always the, the difficult question, the question of resources, capacity, uh, and uh, I mean, Turkish uh, lawyers, victims are not the uh, only one. It's the case in any countries uh, faces mass violation of human rights. Lawyers are not trained to uh, to bring those types of cases in on on this large scale. So it requires a lot of time, skills, resources, and uh, of course financial resources. For universal jurisdiction, I I, I don't think I don't have an answer. There is no uh, uh, money that is given to organizations specifically for this purpose. I would think, and I would refer to uh, uh, Mr. Boye's uh, uh, reference to ECCHR in Berlin, but also uh, the FIDH, the Federa International Federation of Human Rights uh, in France, and you have many others that ha are working alongside, for example, CN organizations, uh, um, and they, they work with them, they train them, and they provide the financial resources to do this. So what I, I would advise is to contact those organizations, explain what, you, what, what is your strategy, what you would like to do, and then see if they're willing to help, if they can, and they also have the capacity to help you. And then also have the capacity maybe to create a project, apply for European funding and other, or state fundings. So th there, there is option, but I think it, it, it's something that it, will take time to build. And I would strongly advise to work alongside uh, lawyers uh, uh, working, already working on it because universal jurisdiction cases are complex cases that require also relation, connection with the uh, prosecution office to understand what is already being conducted and so on. So there's uh, a lot of, uh, of things that needs to be uh, taken into account. And also like to follow up, uh, like in Turkey example, there are also uh, bar associations such as like Ankara Bar Association, they are uh, performing very effective role uh, on fight against torture and enforced disappearance and other types of inhuman uh, violations. Uh, so like I want to also like, ask uh, Mr. Boy, 
uh, how do you think uh, the role of bar association uh, how can bar association plus like the lawyers as a like group can effectively contribute to this uh, challenge fighting with this challenge well, I, I think, for, first of all, uh, one of the real problems with torture is that the lack of interest or the lack of motivation or the lack of decision by the authorities to investigate. So it's up to the civil society. And in front, you always have normally a state, a government or authorities. So uh, if you don't work together with other people, if you stay alone fighting for this situation, at the end, they, they will destroy you. They will destroy you as a, as a lawyer. They will destroy you as an activist. As, and uh, above all, they will destroy you as a person. It, it is not possible to confront the activities of state without a proper group of people supporting you. And also, uh, we lawyers are, are very used to work very alone. And, and that's a mistake. I mean, the only way to fight this situation is to... to to create groups, to create a leverage of people that, that can think together and can work together and can protect themselves. Because um, it is not new, but many people who defend the rights of other people not to be tortured or defend people from being tortured end up becoming also a victim of the, of the same system. So um, it is absolutely necessary that, that that uh, we count with the support of, of organizations and on top of that that the organizations work together the more organizations that work together the better and the stronger the position will be no? mm -hmm. exactly and like not the national wide but also like the international wide uh... Uh, of course international wise because at the end if you let's say that we challenge something in spain mm -hmm. well if we don't work with an organization from abroad at the end, the state will destroy us. Mm -hmm. which, uh, and that's a reality. So you need to work internationally more than locally. Locally, you have to execute the work that is created and supported internationally. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. And like another question coming, and I can address to uh, any panelist who wants to like contribute to that question. Uh, could the global Magnuson legislation be applied for the current situation in Turkey is a mechanism to abolish impunity, especially like after the uh, coup attempt uh, with, the, with the state decree. How long does the process take to implement such legislation? So that, that, that's the question to normally address to Professor Stango, but uh, if any panelists want to contribute, very welcome to hear that. Well, uh, as for me, I can say that uh, a state uh, in the process to adopt uh, such a leg uh, legislation can take uh, several years. Uh, we started this uh, in Italy about uh, one year and a half ago, uh, in the sense that we did uh, lobbying at the Italian parliament. And in March 2019, uh, a bill has been introduced in the Italian Senate, but still it has not been discussed. Uh, in uh, Australia, I was in the federal parliament in uh, Canberra uh, in March 2018, uh, and I explained to several members of the federal uh, senate of Australia uh, what the magnetic legislation is, and uh, only now they are arriving to the point that possibly they will uh, approve such a legislation. So, but once a legislation uh, of the kind of the Magnitsky Act is uh, enforced in the state, uh, then uh, it is uh, relatively uh, fast to arrive to the point to enlist uh, a person uh, in the sanction system. So in the individual sanction system of uh, one state. Thank, thank, thank you so much. If uh, any, any one point, like uh, Mr. Yorimas, like how do you think uh, would it be likely to uh, how they make this legislation applied in Turkey. Uh, I think you're on mute right now. Um, I'm really, I'm really hesitant to venture into uh, both professors' uh, area of expertise, but I can only say this. I mean, it, 
I've talked about the uh, the report is all about the impunity offered to um, to state officials in Turkey and and to the wider public as well to a certain degree. And um, well, there's there's another impunity as far as I'm concerned as a lawyer because I, if I don't see results, you know, it means nothing to me. So so far, um, you know, the the European Court of Human Rights has offered practical impunity to to these perpetrators. And um, and I understand that universal jurisdiction way is uh, is very onerous in, in terms of um, evidencing and and, and uh, financially even. So um, the only thing I hate to say this, but the only way probably uh, available to the victims is uh, the way of uh, Magnitsky Act, which is eventually going to be offered by politicians. So it's going to be an administrative, a political uh, avenue. Um, but uh, I think it is easier in many aspects because the evidencing is, is not hopefully, as far as the American Magnitsky Act is concerned, the evidence uh, the required or sought is uh, less onerous on, on the applicants. And, um, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be um, financial sanctions even, you know, even a travel ban is going to deter quite a few people because um, we have to keep in mind that, you know, all these perpetrators, they have financial motives as well. And uh, so, and they are making the most of the, uh, of the impunity offered to them by, um, you know, um, and there are rumors that, you know, quite a few public officials are, be, are benefiting from this by, you know, taking money from, from victims for one way or another, uh, you know, removing them, their names uh, from, from blacklists, so to speak. And uh, of course, they, will, they, are looking to, they are looking for places to spend their, 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 the money they have, they have made through these illegal legal activities. And uh, they are looking to Europe. And I'm very, very optimistic. And I'm, I, I hope, I hope the, uh, the European Magnitsky Act, which has been deliberated, which has been prepared, uh, is going to answer that question. But, you know, uh, fingers crossed. That, that's, that's, the only, that's the only available avenue which has some realistic, in my opinion, uh, chance of, of success as far as, you know, deterring these heinous people. Thank you. Thank you. And another question come to actually uh, Ms. Barak. Uh, considering the current uh, process, like before the ECHR, and even like the internally in Turkey, and uh, the uh, internal mechanism, it takes so much time. So when these victims apply to ECHR, they are waiting for years. And would it be possible, one of our uh, participants asking, would it be possible for applicants to argue that their fair trial uh, rights is also implicitly or maybe like um, virtually violated by the um, by, by, by the authorities. So, so fair trial rights uh, violated by the European Court of Human Rights. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I it, it's a difficult. I, w I would say I'm, to to answer uh, honestly that the judicial process takes a very long time, and unfortunately, uh, regional and international proceedings takes take. Uh, even longer than those at the domestic uh, level. The delays at the ECHR are not unique to the ECHR. It's the case at the International Criminal Court, for example, where the first case took 10 years to be finalized. It's a, it, is, it is a real problem, but it doesn't mean that the court is not doing anything. The court is being, the ECHR is being very transparent with its mechanisms. It's publishing uh, uh, regularly and on a yearly basis the cases. It's addressing uh, the situation and there's so much one court can do when they receive thousands of applications but i mean and ultimately i mean let's say there is a wish to bring a, to, to to argue this where to bring the claim there's no avenue for this so i i'm i i would think that this would be counterproductive in a way uh, the ECHI is working in the favor of the victims and is trying its best with its own limitation budgetary limitations staff limitation and so on to achieve uh, uh, justice 
and it may be very frustrated and I, I can tell you I'm the first one to be very frustrated uh, by, by the length of the proceedings but it is unfortunately a reality we have to face due to the small size of the courts uh, at the moment. Okay, I assume uh, we, we, we don't have any question remain. So since uh, we are getting close to end, uh, I would like to ask also like all uh, participants, all panelists, if they would like to provide a final comment, uh, what needs to be done, uh, what they expect from NGOs such as us like to, to do in third year in future. Any comments, any final remarks? Maybe, maybe I, I will, I will, I will add uh, just a, a last comment. And I think what what stem from from the discussion is also the uh, the frustration and the limits of the international and regional response. And uh, in a way, it is frustrating. And I, I hear uh, Josh Kohn, uh, the, the frustration because when you are seeing those violations committed every day to your family, to your friends, uh, uh, and you are yourself a, a victim of. Of, of those violations, you, it is it is frustrating, but it doesn't mean that there is no way. And uh, it's a step; it's a process that takes time. And unfortunately, unfortunately, some victims, uh, in many many cases, got uh, uh, got um, uh, reparations and, and remedy. It's just not not necessarily in front of our eyes when we when we want to see it. And I understand. And it also highlights that our system is 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 imperfect and it's a very it's a political system also uh, 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 th that we have to deal with and to to navigate in order to uh, to find the right the best and the right solution and uh, i think and i really maintain that universal jurisdiction in uh, today is uh, would be one of the best especially in germany uh, uh, knowing uh, uh, um, germans position on universal jurisdiction and its willingness to open to syria and potentially to turkey uh, i I, I wouldn't be so sure that they would they would refuse opening cases. So there is things that need to be done, and coordination is of course necessary. And I think one organization cannot do it on its own. It's a lot of investigative work. It's a lot of of uh, of of, um, of uh, um, sorry of, of work to do. So I think yeah, it's a step by step. And I know that you're doing you're doing a lot. And also as I know in the UK with extradition cases also, which are also extremely important. And maybe if you want to add something, I think it's it's interesting that the UK also has been one of the countries where extradition cases have uh, have uh, have uh, led to people not being deported on the principle of non refoulement and it's one of the highest number of uh, cases in the country. Sorry, I'm adding one more question. Yeah. But that, that's important because like as Mr. Boy said, sometimes like it's not uh, enough to be right uh, to commit, but also like you need to have the like uh, audience accepting it, and like in that regard, like the contribution and like the collaboration from NGOs, like they may be, um, they, they may be contribute to the process very significantly. Again, thank thank you so much for our panelists, and I cannot see like any more question in the chat box. Also, like I cannot see the uh, raise your hand tools is being used, so. Again, I would like to thank all of our panelists for shedding the light on this significant but very really liberal topic and sharing their time and expertise with us today. And another big thanks should be our valuable audience tonight for their questions and also contributions. Once again, on behalf of Human Rights Defender, thanks very much for your participat participation in this important event and I wish you have a great weekend and more importantly, great and secure future.